welcome back. Thank you for joining us for this last panel before lunch. Uh, my name is Emerson Brooking. I'm a resident senior fellow and deputy director at the Digital Forensic Research Lab at the Atlantic Council. And uh, for this session, Impacts of Malign Influence Campaigns on Democratic Institutions, I'm very pleased to be joined by an outstanding uh, group. We have Kelly Wicker, uh, Director of Science and Technology Innovation Programs at the Wilson Center, uh, Roberta Braga, Founder and Executive Director of the Digital Democracy Institute of the Americas, and Maggie Feldman uh, Pilch, Founder of Unicorn Strategies and a, a non-resident fellow at the Atlantic Council Scowcroft Center. So I uh, just, I, by very brief introduction, the purpose of this panel is to uh, consider, consider gender-based targeting uh, which we often see in malign influence campaigns, as well as gender-based harms. The idea that uh, when half of a population's voices are perennially suppressed, it means that the uh, state itself is no longer free and democratic. But uh, just with that quick opening, Kelly, I want to turn first to you to talk just broadly about your work at the intersection of um, uh, technology issues and uh, women and gender targeting. Yeah. So. The key for us is always to talk about the fact that technology is ultimately just a tool. It's not good or bad. It all comes down to how you use it. And it can be leveraged simultaneously for both things. So every decision we make about how we build both technological capabilities and how we build out governance of technology has implications for both sides of that coin. Um, for women specifically, we see a lot of really positive things. Um, I'm thinking about with the growth of digital assets and decentralized finance, we see women using uh, fintech to escape abusive situations or build new sources of income for themselves in uh, developing countries. We also see with the introduction of things like AI and social media, the ability to more easily um, organize your community, lowering the barriers to entrepreneurship, and in general, just kind of creating new opportunities for women to engage in society and to build something for themselves. But at the same time, the growth of these same technologies has created new attack surfaces for women. Um, specifically, gender-based violence in technology is such a huge problem. We have an acronym for it, TFGBV, because we can't sit here and say technology facilitated gender-based violence every single time. <laughs> um, and then we laugh, but like it, you know, it, it's, it's such a serious issue, and it impacts so many women. I think the, the key thing we think about when we think about this is disinformation and deep fakes. And this is not a new problem. Women have been attacked by deep fakes and disinformation for decades. But it took, for some reason, uh, Taylor Swift being attacked for anybody to really care about it um, who had any kind of legislative power. So we do see now some movement on, um, especially with the growth of generative AI, of addressing the fact that deep fakes are a significant problem and that there needs to be at least some kind of uh, civil recourse, if not criminal recourse, for women attacked. Um, but this is a problem because, like you said, you know, if women can't speak, that's half of society, that we're not living in a society if women are, are oppressed. At the same time, the, the results of disinformation and the results of these attacks on women is to shake the foundations of the democracies that we live in. Well, thank you for that. And now, Roberta, I want to turn to you because uh, in addition to the study of line influence campaigns, you're also uh, studying certain populations and their susceptibility to them. Yes, um, thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Really nice to be here. Um, so at DDIA, we're kind of combining public opinion research and narrative analysis work to inform uh, interventions that build a healthier internet for Latino communities. And we're really trying to connect the dots between what we see in the United States and what we see across the Americas. Um, and so really what we're trying to do is both understand what are the root drivers of engagement with disinformation, for example, how are Latinos uniquely engaging with disinformation on the internet, and what psychological, social media consumption and other drivers can really impact who the people are who see and believe disinformation. Um, on the other hand, we're also looking at narratives. So as I mentioned, the silver lining of information integrity challenges is that when it comes to this information, the meta narratives, they don't actually change that much. Um, there are maybe, I would say, 10 master meta narratives now that we've identified as a community working in this space that tend to get recycled over and over every election that we see. And that really ranges from things like 
election fraud narratives to anti-immigrant sentiments to gender-based disinformation narratives. And what really tends to change underneath each of those meta-narratives are the specific claims that we see. And so those will be you know, unique to certain circumstances, but if we can recognize that those meta-narratives and the techniques aren't really that different, um, I think it really helps us approach the problem a little better. The conversation around Latinos is interesting because a lot of people will say, Latino communities in the United States are more susceptible to disinformation. Our polling actually found that that's not the case. Um, the biggest challenge when it comes to disinformation in Latino communities is a challenge of trust. The majority, we did a poll in 2022 of 2,400 Latino adults in the US where we tested 16 narratives, each person saw eight, um, and we wanted to get a sense of how familiar and believing people were in the narratives. The majority of people didn't believe any of the narratives and didn't, a lot of them were familiar with the narratives but were not believing it. So high levels of familiarity, lower levels of belief. The people who did see and believe disinformation narratives that we tested more often were actually not low access to information, low levels of education people. They were the people who expressed they had the highest levels of interest in politics, um, people who tended to consume very partisan news media, and people who had conspiratorial tendencies. Um, so that is an interesting thing to consider, but the last point I'll make here is that when it comes to gender-based disinformation, I do think that the challenge isn't one of trust, it's actually one of um, delegitimizing women. I think a lot of people who engage in gender-based disinformation campaigns are trying to dismiss, um, deconstruct, or outright kind of kick out of politics and other positions of power women. And what we tend to see are the same, again, just like those meta narratives and techniques, the same types of attacks recycled over and over and over. So I think it's narratives about women's capability to lead, um, narratives calling into question their integrity, narratives that say women must be men, they can't be women, they must be men dressing as women, or they must have slept their way to the top to get into the role that they're in. And so I think in the same vein that in the conversation around Latino communities, we often talk about the same meta narratives repeating themselves, I think we can recognize that when it comes to gender-based disinformation, broadly speaking, um, the same style of attack and technique is also something we're gonna see over and over. Can I jump on that real quick? Please. Sorry, I'm gonna jump in. I, I love that point you brought up about the meta narratives being very consistent. That's something we see also, whether or not, you know, people I'm sure probably tell you, well, I'm not Latina, so it doesn't matter to me. Or like, I'm not a woman, so it doesn't matter to me. And globally, we see this too. Well, we don't care about the disinformation that's happening in Nigeria, because that's Nigeria. When it works in one place, we always see that narrative come back, because what works in one place will be reused mm -hmm. on your community, on your city, on your population, on your ethnicity, whatever it is. And so this is a, this is a problem for everyone. We can't ignore the lessons we're learning in a, in a community that's being well-researched, because that has implications for all of us. And I think people sometimes miss that this is, it's not a women's problem, it's an everybody problem. Absolutely. Um, and now, Maggie, I wanted to turn to you, uh, especially as we talk about the construction and targeting of these uh, influence campaigns, because you have a particular perspective here. Yeah, and first, thank you all for being here um, and to the Atlantic Council team for putting this together. And it's always a joy and a pleasure to share conversation with the three of you and to do it in public makes it even more pleasant. Um, and I think a lot of, you know, certainly what you both have said and, and what Roberta mentioned, the undermining of women um, is crucial here when we're talking about the targeting of malign influence campaigns because when we're talking malign influence campaigns, we're not talking just one person, right? But it is the same ideas, the same structures, and the same, let's call them biases for the sake of this conversation, that we are then exacerbating or pulling out and making bigger. Um, what do I mean by that? So um, by undermining women on an individual level, we then, basically create two options. One is that we ignore, as Kelly said, um, let's say things happening to girls online. Uh, we don't take them seriously. And we create um, not an actual dark web, but sort of a dark web, right? We create a darker corner of the space where um, conversations and campaigns and ideas can be planted, um, focusing 
on women, and I don't mean targeting women in the victimization way, I mean in the, oh, this is a community that is really interested in true crime, seems like a great place to sow some counter democratic institutions messaging. We see that all the time. But the number of people who take seriously spending time on corners of Instagram and TikTok, pretty small in the national security space. Um, and you know, I think it's also really important to recognize that what we call malign influence camp campaigns is exactly what others call the work we do of democracy building, right? The words here matter. Um, and I point that out because as someone with an influence operations background, that's the work that I do, that's what I write about, that's literally what I spend most of my time doing is these kinds of campaigns. I recognize that the CCP and others find what I do to be a malign influence campaign, but that's just because I'm crazy about democracy. Um, and so I spend a lot of time looking at exactly what Kelly and Roberta are talking about um, and trying to see how do we, dare I say, weaponize it for good. Um, but it's a little scary because for exactly the reasons they've laid out, people aren't paying attention and neither are the institutions. Mm -hmm. So I, I meant to say at the top, but I hope to engage the audience as well. We'll turn to audience questions in about uh, 15 minutes. But first, I want to co-opt which uh, something that almost certainly be an audience question. Let's talk about AI for a second. <laughs> or let's broaden the aperture, not just AI, but I, I think consider the way that very recent, comparatively recent technologies um, might change or exacerbate gender dynamics. So um, I guess a little more in, in each of your works, how you see AI, but then maybe also just how, how social media have sort of changed. Uh, the things that you study. And I'll add one more uh, point of consideration here, which is um, uh, the extent to which women have played a role in or been excluded in the shaping of these technologies early. And Kelly, first back to you. Yeah, so I'm usually the one to break the ice on the AI topic, so I appreciate not taking the fall on that one this time. Um, I think um, when we talk about gender dynamics and AI, the most telling thing to me is that there's always been a lot of women working in AI, but there's been almost an erasure of them recently. <clears throat> and part of that is because we saw the AI ethics field be very dominated by strong female voices. And they were working at Twitter, and they were working at Microsoft, and they were working at like, all the major tech companies. Um, and then many of them, when they raised the red flag about disinformation or about AI bias or about um, coming generative issues, they were summarily let go. Well, that's an opinion that's not gonna make us any money, so you can see yourself out. So there's, a, there's still this contingent of women who are very active in AI, and as everyone's kind of you know, chewing on these questions of identity and ethics and bias, these women are like, we've been talking about this for years. Listen, um, I'm thinking about women like Emily Bender, who co-authored the Stochastic Parrots paper, um, Margaret Mitchell, there's, uh, there's women who are talking about uh, larger issues like uh, algorithmic justice, like uh, Joy, whose last name I will butcher if I try. Um, and then we've got people who are talking about specific issues like Sasa Lucioni at Hugging Face, who's looking at climate impacts of AI. Women are a part of AI. We get erased because we have these godfathers who come out and they make these pronouncements about, well, we're all going to die soon because AI will be sentient. And you're like, great, <laughs> fantastic. Maybe we should have done something about that. <laughs> um, and those kinds of discussions don't really move the ball forward. We, we can't, we're not talking about opportunities that are open by AI. We're also not talking about how to mitigate the issues that we are facing right now, like the use of AI to create deep fakes. And so I think it's really important to recognize that there are long-standing female leaders in this field and to listen to them. These women are engineers. They are not, you know, sometimes they get dismissed as, oh, well, you know, you're an ethicist because you're, you're just a poli-sci person. No, these women are engineers. <laughs> they know what they're talking about. Um, and they've been talking for a long time. Read the things that women in the field are saying. Pay attention to them. Bring them to events. Let them speak. Give them the platform they are gonna be able to underpin the perspective that we're here talking about that all women are hoping gets talked about in the rooms where these policies are being decided. Mm -hmm. So I have a quick follow-up here. Yeah. Um, could you speak a little more, I think, about the earlier history of, um, uh, well, AI ethics, but, and, but thinking 
I'm essentially thinking about the first generation of people who maybe blew the whistle or were trying to draw attention to this, but who were almost too early. Like, um, are those voices excluded now? That is, is it different people who were driving the conversation and the people who were first are excluded? I th it's, what's really interesting is some of the questions we're having about bias um, being baked into systems, we, you know, we didn't just start using AI when ChatGPT came out. We've been using AI for, for forever. And we've been having these conversations about are the systems that are in place making biased decisions in healthcare, in housing, in employment, in labor. Um, and it's like all of a sudden we started over. We, we had a lot of scholarship from men and women on this topic. And we started over because everyone suddenly redefined AI to exclusively mean generative AI. And so where we used to come into rooms and talk about what is AI, people would say, oh, it's algorithmic recommenders, it's um, the, the big data uh, analysis things. Now they're like, oh, it's, it's DALI, it's GPT. Like, yes, that, that is also AI. But um, these questions aren't new. We've been working on them forever. Let's not lose what we talked about before. So in some ways, yeah, we've, we've kind of dropped the threads we already had going and restarted them. Um, but there's a lot of really smart people working on this mm -hmm. who have that more historical lens, who are bringing in the older um, research and who are looking at this question, not as a new question, but as a continuation of our existing questions on every technology, data, privacy, talent, um, the role that um, the users should play in bearing the burden of security versus the companies. These are questions that predate AI. They predate almost every technology that was plaguing us right now. We just, for some reason, keep restarting every time it comes up in a new way. Mm -hmm. and I, Thank you. Yes, Roberta. I was just going to say, I, I, I remember, uh, so I used to work here at the Atlantic Council, and I remember back in 2018, um, talking to a journalist about deep fake technologies. And back then, the message we were sending is, look, deep fakes are not uh, something that we should really get distracted by right now, because it's a very small percentage of the online harms that we're dealing with. And we really need to focus on um, the very basic counter disinformation strategies that as a society we still haven't mastered yet. And I think that's back today. Um, but the one point I would make here, and again, we could talk about this forever. I feel like AI has bubbled up as the next hot topic. Disinformation was that two years ago. Before that, it was countering violent extremism, mm -hmm. CVE. I Coming feel like it's the same. All three of them yeah. being the same thing. <laughs> the yeah. same sets of issues, yeah. just kind of getting new names every few years, to mm -hmm. your point. But um, I think something that we haven't really delved into yet is that women are at, actually at the forefront of dealing with the harms of AI technologies. Um, don't quote me on this, but the largest percentage of deep fakes are revenge pornography. It's over, I believe, 90%, I 90, um, 98 no. yeah, right. percent. Yeah. And so I think that often we don't talk much about that. We talked about it when Taylor Swift was targeted, but it's, it's an uncomfortable thing to talk about. But I think we get bogged down in the like new AI tech, oh, the Pope in a puffy jacket, what have you. <laughs> But women have been dealing with this issue now for a long, long while. And so I think that it's really important that we not only make sure we're engaging the women experts in this, but also that we're bringing legal precedent from the offline world into the online world to deal with some of these issues that may be affecting women first, and letting that then set precedent for some of the other solutions that we'll talk about, I'm sure. And I would add Danielle Citrone, right? She and I, we had a conversation, she and I, in public at an event I hosted in like 2018 about this and, in fact, about the legal precedent, right? And, and to quote her, she's a MacArthur Genius Grant. I know they don't really call it that, but I'm calling it that because it is what it is, uh, awardee in probably about the same year. Um, if you want to know where the next uh, most dangerous thing on the internet is, go talk to a black trans woman, right? Um, the more undermined and marginalized and written off a community is, the more they're being targeted online, the more they're being targeted everywhere. Um, but that these are testing grounds, right, for people, organizations, states, non-state entities that do this work and want to do it well exactly what Roberta and Kelly have said. You know, if it works well in one place, they're gonna scale it up. 
And something that all three of us spend quite a lot of time talking to one another about is we're talking a lot about what's scary right now. And let's not kid ourselves. This is terrifying. There's a lot to be afraid of. But fear is not the only option. Um, you know, you asked how are we looking at uh, AI or generative AI in our work. To be honest, I don't do too much research. Uh, it's not my job. Um, there's really wonderful human beings who do research that I then learn from. Um, it's my job to make the stuff. Um, and so ways I'm using generative AI, uh, I have no graphic design background at all. Like, do I have a vibe? Yes, but it is not my passion. <laughs> um, so thank the Lord for the ability to type in, like, please make me you know, I say please to my generative AI entities because I try to be There's polite. There's research that shows that politeness actually generates research. Right, right. And I was like, I, right? See, it's really good to have the people that do the research. And I asked yesterday, in fact, for um, a non-metallic but still silver, slightly turning, not flashing disco ball GIF. And I got one. And I used it in a video I did yesterday in which I... I think totally appropriately called the supreme um, leader of Iran one of the most annoying incels on the internet. Like, fight me if you disagree. Um, <laughs> so for me, and maybe this is because I'm the person who watches Band of Brothers while I fold my laundry and find it very soothing, um, fear is a powerful motivator. My therapist would like me to deal with it in a different way. I don't seem to be able to. So why not just be better at it? Can I add one thing, um, Emerson? So I think that another thing that gets missed in the conversation that I think will add to what um, my fellow panelists have mentioned is that I think when it comes to AI, what we're really talking, when we talk about the dangers, what we're really talking about is like everything and every, everything and anything that's on the internet that is flawed right now. And so I think yeah. the, the generative AI's potential to cause harm really comes from the fact that we're dealing with a tool or a set of tools that's pulling information from a body of knowledge online that is inherently flawed. And so I think yeah. just one thing I wanted to add is when it comes to communities like Latino communities in the United States, there are a lot of stereotypes online about communities um, that we're dealing with. And what we found even before we were discussing AI is that social media companies, technology companies, they really are doing kind of an asymmetric job of dealing with um, content that is non-English language content on the whole of their platforms. I think how that translate, translates over to AI is that we've seen that the terms of service that um, some of the technology companies are implementing are not being applied or producing the same results when the prompts that go into the tool are related to minority communities or when the prompts that go into the tool are in non-English languages. And so we've run a set of experiments at DDIA, for example, on ChatGPT, where we were trying to test whether OpenAI's policies around creating ch chat bots would you know, stick up, essentially. And what we found was that, bottom line, it did not when the prompts were put in in Spanish and when they were put in with a Latino angle, it actually gave all of the instructions for creating a chatbot that would deceive Latino communities uh, in a variety of different ways. So I think like that's just the other kind of point I wanted to make sure I made is that um, just like women get marginalized in these conversations, I think sometimes minority communities in the US do too. Totally. But again, we are kind of dealing with the brunt of the harm sometimes when things are not appropriately or, or symmetrically at least implemented. Um, I mean, we saw a measles outbreak in New York City, the result of good old-fashioned flyering in a non-English language that no one paid attention to, um, that then, of course, resulted in a rise in anti-Semitic attacks against uh, what some people call ultra-Orthodox or more eloquent among us would call Hasidic communities, because somebody funded by a government, dare I shall name it, um, did a bunch of flyers in Yiddish about the dangers of vaccines. Um, and it worked. Can I, I want to jump on something, sorry, that Roberta brought up. Um, <clears throat> your point about like these systems are based on flawed data sets. Like, we work with what we have. We only have the data that we have, and it was created by a society that was imbalanced. And we are aware of that, and we're working on it, et cetera, et cetera. But I think that kind of draws my attention a little bit to an unintentional malign influence operation, where not even, it's mm -hmm. not that anyone has decided to do this, but 
every time a girl or a woman uses an AI system, the output that they get is going to reinforce particular gender stereotypes. And that's insidious if you're not aware of it and you're not watching it. So, you know, like the, the obvious one everyone always uses and it's old, but it's still worth it. If you ask for a nurse, you get a woman. If you ask for a doctor, you get a man. This has always been, you know, and this is like, this is a societal problem. If you, if you write about a nurse with gender neutral terms, people assume it's a woman. This is like not a new problem. But it means something when young women are starting to use these systems at younger and younger ages in schools, which is great. I'm very pro using uh, AI as a tool and learning how to use it. But we should remember that this continuous reinforcement of women have a place and it's not this, it's this. That's that is a malign influence operation that nobody actually headed up. Um, there's, I don't know whose responsibility it is, you know, like there, at the end of the day, we're not gonna ever be able to remove all the harms from any of these systems, the embedded harms exist, and part of what we need to do is pre-bunk with people, the same we need to do with disinformation broadly. You teach people ahead of time, this is what you're going to see, and then when it happens, they're ready for it. But it's just something to continue to think about. How can we solve this problem? And no one's going to solve it if women are not in the room where discussions are being made about what comes next, both on policy and on technical development. What comes next? How do we clean the data sets? How do we generate better data? What do we do when people are using systems and this is their experience? I have one more question before we turn to the audience, and it is what comes next. Uh, so for <laughs> folks in the audience, begin to think about your questions. Folks watching online, please begin to use the Q&A function. And Kelly, I, I want to stay with you then and ask, in a 45-minute panel, we're not going to solve that much, but are there particular policy actions that should be taken now to mitigate or reduce uh, this impact uh, of gender-based targeting? And this is like the million-dollar question that my job is supposed to be to answer this. Um, <laughs> It's so difficult, but I think um, the first thing is that there's, a, like I mentioned, there's a number of bills uh, being considered in Congress right now about empowering women to seek damages when they've been affected by deep fakes. I think that's like step one. Like that's something that's easy to do. It doesn't, it, we're not solving the problem or at least recognizing in the legal system, this is a problem and we're done with it. Um, on the technical side, I think, what we're doing a lot at the Wilson Center is we're trying to empower communities to advocate for themselves. Part of the problem is that a lot of these discussions are happening exclusively with industry and government, and people are either having it just filter down or they're just not engaging with AI systems or with disinformation at all. This is someone else's problem. It's not someone else's problem, it is your problem. And it's also your opportunity. So learn how to use AI systems, learn how disinformation works, learn the issue, and then advocate for yourself up. And so as much as we can do to empower as many people as possible to understand the problem and understand the opportunity, the more I think we're gonna get smarter policy if we do that in tandem with educating policymakers as much as we can about the options they have in front of them. And quickly here, I just wanted to note um, how acute this problem is that um, regarding use of uh, Gen AI for uh, revenge porn and uh, intersectional pornography and bullying, we saw first, I think, in Spanish public schools uh, last summer, uh, you know, the use of these deep fake nudes, uh, classmates. Um, but now we see this popping up more and more in the U.S., right? This is happening right now. It's not just, uh, say, taking preventive measures, like something has to be done to address this thing that's out there that's going to continue. Uh, but Roberta, next to you. Sure. Um, well, I could, I mean, that the, the solutions conversation is another one. I think a lot of people come to us asking, you know, can you test out what works better, X or Y? And I think that what I would say here is like, this is not the right frame of reference to approach solutions when it comes to information integrity issues. Um, everything works for different groups of people who see and believe things online at different rates, who have li lived experiences that are different. Um, and so I don't think it's a matter of, do you fact check or do you pre-bunk? You do all of it. You just, you have to do more research into understanding who the audiences are that would benefit from those types of solutions best. And so at DDIA, some of what we're doing, I mentioned the poll we did last year, um, we actually, from that poll, developed a six-part typology where we identified which groups were the ones that were 
uh, at the different levels. So for example, who are the people who see very little and believe very little disinformation, who see a lot and believe it often, who see it a lot but don't really believe it, right? And so those people will serve as different um, trusted messengers for different approaches or they'll benefit from different solutions. When it comes to women, so demographics weren't a huge predictor of um, rates of familiarity and belief, but we did identify what we call the high priority group. Um, they were the people who were highly exposed to misinformation, but retained a high level of uncertainty. Um, that was 21% of the sample of 2,400 Latinos. And I think what was interesting is that these, these people tended to be younger, disproportionately female women, um, more Spanish dominant, they had, they maybe were lower on the social trust scale, but still there was something about them that was leading them to retain this high level of uncertainty. And so maybe for this group of people, it's a combination of, well, if they're seeing eight or two to 16 narratives, but believing one, then a fact check might work for them depending on the issue, who are they? Maybe they're trusted in their communities already so they can serve as, um, you know, trainers or spokespeople or people who talk about different issues that come up. So I think that's where I would say about the solutions is like by and large, we tend to be a little simplistic in how we approach counter disinformation, specifically strategies. Um, in my case, for example, I'm gonna die on this hill is like Latino communities are not a monolith. Um, in the US, like in the US I'm a Latina in Brazil where I'm originally from, I'm white. Um, like in, you know, identity is complicated. There are a lot of different things that go into it. But anyways, Latino communities are not a monolith. It's not the case that you know, we're susceptible or gullible or vulnerable to disinformation like some headlines suggest. And when you break down the very diverse communities that we're talking about when you talk about Latinos, different groups are gonna deal with disinformation differently and the different solutions that will apply to those different groups need to be taken into consideration. And it's not invest more in fact checks here and less in pre-bunks here or vice versa. It's like invest it all invest in it all and then do a little better job of like identifying who the groups are that could benefit from those things. So solutions are what get me out of bed in the morning, right? Um, and so something that I've spent a huge portion of my time and my career on is, is building institutions and systems to change what it means to be an expert, particularly in national security and defense, specifically what other people define as an expert. Um, it might seem a little strange that this is what I'm talking about right now, but there is a reason. Um, and I say that, and I think, Roberta, it's a, a perfect bridge, is that um, whether it's Washington, D.C. or some other capital, we have this idea of what someone who knows about the defense budget looks like, what they sound like, what, they, what metaphors and similes they use, um, what color their hair is, whether or not they have a manicure, all of these things. Um, and the thing is, is that the more specific, the more narrow that definition is, the more disconnected it becomes from the people that are supposedly a part of this democracy. Um, so I would say there are two things that we can do to make some real progress in terms of solutions. One, recognize that just because someone communicates differently than you, does not mean that it lacks intellectual rigor. As someone who spends an awful lot of time explaining the defense budget to women in Sephora, do you have any idea how hard that is, <laughs> right? Like, I'm competing against some incredible moisturizer, I've got 90 seconds, and I'm using every dollar of those master's degrees, I promise, and I read the green book front to back as my idea of a good time. Um, these two can attest to it. So recognize, as Roberta said, right, like, trusted messengers, um, it's not just the person, it's the messaging. And as Roberta mentioned, invest, I'm gonna be a little more explicit, fund this work. I, I get me a shirt that says fund this work, I mean. But I, I mention that because I think it's been over a decade. I'm sure before I was born, we were having conversations about DC's inability to communicate policy and current events to the average American or global citizen. And somehow, we've decided that communications is the same thing as marketing and that they're definitely both women's work um, and we don't care about it. It's overhead. It's not overhead. I do not care how great your thing on the defense budget is if no one reads it. 
I don't care how great it is if no one understands it. And I really don't care about it if no one else cares about it. Well, thanks for that. And um, uh, well, Imagine on the what point it's of like to deal with me all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, well put. And um, on the point of communication, now, audience, we'd like you to communicate with us. Uh, we'll take two questions to start. We have about 10 minutes left. And uh, you, please. And, and then, yes, and then uh, in the back as well. And uh, we're, we have, yes, we have a mic Thanks. stand right there. Thank you. Um, amazing talk. Uh, I appreciated everyone's like differing but similar perspectives. Um, I just have so many questions, but I'll stick to one to give other people time. So this is, uh, oh, I'm on the screen. Uh, <laughs> Kelly, uh, your point kind of got me thinking about this and your conversation kept going kind of in this direction of you said like technology is not good or bad, it's just a tool. Um, so something I was like kind of thinking about is like you talk about like the human bias of the data sets of generative AI, but what about human bias in the like creation of the mm -hmm. technology? Um, so do you think like this can allow like kind of the malign influence campaigns, like the creation of technology? And if if so, um, like what are the like alternatives, right? Like I think of kind of just coming from kind of like a weird artsy game design background of like alternative technologies like mechatronics or like the Fediverse or uh, esoteric programming languages are a really interesting one. Um, so like, do you think there's an economic advantage to this? Like policy level, like what, like what do you think just on this generally? More Roblox, more <laughs> Roblox, yeah. Um, Okay, so no, the only yes is my answer <laughs> to this. Like, so we actually produced a, a snapshot of um, the impact on Latino communities from another set of experience with, experiments we did last year. And something we noted is that, yes, the people who control the creation of the tools that impact our society to this extent of a level tend to look and be and have the similar backgrounds that they do. Um, very few Latinos are part of making those tools, right? And I think it's same with maybe women, is like the rates are just very different. And so yes, like I think the biases of the creators of the technologies are absolutely affecting how they come out and then affect our communities. And it's to the extent that I think it's like things that maybe they don't even ever talk about or have to deal with, and so it doesn't even come up. Um, I think about you know the deep fake conversation we had on revenge pornography. Men are not, no man that I've ever met has had to deal with the types of yeah. attacks that at least 10 women that I know have I had mean, to deal least, with on the I mean, at least I would think all three of us on the stage in some capacity. <laughs> um, and so, luckily not on the deep oh, fake. All right, well, that's God. just me then. Cool. <laughs> But yeah, so I think it's like if it's not even on your radar, then it's not something you're going to factor into the creation of the tool. So yes. Um, and then on the economic incentives piece, so there are some great organizations that are investing in um, minority communities going into tech. So I'm thinking of the Caper Center, for example. They just launched a great like Latin tech um, ecosystem report yesterday on the Hill. Um, and so I would say, yeah, just like more investment into facilitating the entry of different types of people into the spaces where they, they can then be a part of it. Great, it. if I can tag on one little thing on that. Um, I was at a really interesting um, task force meeting on responsible human narratives and technology. And we talked, um, there was a professor there presenting his research on um, the fact that every technology has a script embedded in it. What do I want you to do with this? Mm -hmm. Even speed bumps have a script. The script is go slower. But we don't always know what the user will do with that script. So first of all, the question is, were the scripts designed by a group of people that represent people accurately? But then second of all, what happens once that script is released into the wild? How do people respond to it? What do they do with it? Um, and that's such a fascinating question to me. This research is, there. there's a, many people in this task force who are doing this kind of research, which the ultimate question is, should we use technology to enforce some kind of moral outcome that we have all agreed on when really we have not agreed on. It's a group of people in Silicon Valley agreed on it. And then if we do that, what will it actually result in? Because the answers may surprise you. <laughs> I'm telling you this is why I'm crazy about Roblox, right? We were talking about this before we got on stage. 
Um, I got to spend a couple of minutes yesterday in a public webinar. Anyone who knows me knows that I love Paris Hilton. Why do I love Paris Hilton? She is, the, oh, really? Okay, so she is the author and sponsor of what is currently the most wide-ranging legislation to combat human trafficking in the continental United States. Um, her media company, 1111 Media, is doing incredible stuff in the metaverse, extended reality, virtual reality, particularly Roblox. My idea of a good time is like, can we please, 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 someone let me build an embassy in the metaverse? And I mean, the, the Swedes did this in my second life, right? Um, and I have two much younger siblings, um, and so I'm learning a little bit about Roblox from them. And what happens when you give people the technology? What do they make? Um, the inside of a seven-year-old's brain is an incredible place. And I think if we can find a way to not lose that and bring it in, I'm a huge fan of game design and national security, like more, please. Um, and we should be spending more time not just talking about Roblox, but like doing some stuff on Roblox. So if we have time for one more question, please in the back if you'd like to use the microphone and we'll end on this. Yes, oh, please. Uh, my name is Uliana. I'm a journalist from Ukraine. And actually, uh, recently, there were reported about uh, using uh, the face of famous uh, blogger, uh, the woman blogger, uh, uh, producing uh, fake news. And she were reported about that, and it was like a big deal because uh, her face was was used uh, for producing face new, fake news. And actually, you were uh, already started talking about the result of that uh, uh, AI and technologies and tools we already have. So my question is about what about responsibility of that fake news and what about responsibility of bad usage of AI even in that production like fake news and all that stuff. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. And uh, who would like to start? I, I mean, the, the thing, so that is a great question and I also feel like it's exactly what's holding back so much legislation and regulation nowadays is the attribution of responsibility. And what we've heard say in the past is, for example, we have slander and libel laws in the, in, in the world, and they were designed for a reason. And in the offline world, if you can attribute um, intent to a specific person in a slander and libel case, then you can pr prosecute them on that, and a lawyer will be able to, to build like sort of a chain of evidence leading back to that person. If you're able to do that in the online world, ideally it would work the same way. So when we talk about the offline to online pipeline of legal precedent is like why can't slander and libel laws be updated to the online context? I think the answer, the easy answer has been, well, you that chain of evidence is harder to create online. So like you can't tell exactly who started something that ended up resulting in someone's reputation being ruined. Um, but that said, I feel like that's that's a little, like, we shouldn't stop there. Like, why give up there? I feel like we need to figure out a way to make that happen. We have so many tools at our disposal now. And I think, like, you know, maybe the legal field can update to that. But I don't know the answer is, like, the responsibility is in part on the technology company, I think. But they, I understand why they can't be responsible for every malign thing that their users do. And then if you can't attribute cause to the malign user, you can identify who they are, then what happens? And I don't, I don't have an answer to that question. If so, I did, we'd be somewhere else. And, and I don't know, the, in, I, the legal question is an important one. I am not a lawyer. I say that quite frequently, don't have an answer. But first, thank you so much for the work that you're doing and for being here today. Um, I would say that responsibility to me is dual-hatted at minimum. And there's a social and moral responsibility um, we social norms are a thing, right? And we can enforce behavior norms. We do it all the time. I can tell from the way that people look at me on the metro that we do it all the time. There's no reason why we don't do that um, in this same context. The other thing I'll say is that um, Danielle Citrone, Ben Wittes, and I and some others had a very public conversation about five or six years ago um, about well, is the, is the danger, is the violence, is the harm of deep fake pornography the fact that people believe it, or is it the actual thing? And what would happen if a bunch of us decided to opt in and all have deep, foreign, deep fake porn made about us? 
of, of us. And therefore, it was so common that it changed the social norm, the social assumption that what you were looking at was real, right? If we flipped it somehow, could it be done and would it be useful? I don't know the, the answer. It was a thought experiment. Clearly, I've spent a lot of time in you know, liberal arts background. Um, but this, that's the kind of thing, like we have to have really uncomfortable conversations and get outside of what we think is our comfort zone. And can we have the last word? Um, yeah, I think uh, just to go back to one thing that Roberta picked up, one of the our, like continuous problems in AI governance is that there is this circle of the people that are involved in the fact that this is a, a product that you can make, and the question is, who is liable? Is it the data set? Is it the user? Is it the company that made the model? Is it the platform that the thing was posted on? Is it the regulators who didn't market it? You know, um, there's a that is, and you said this, like this is our ultimate struggle. This is why we cannot really figure out how to move forward because who is responsible? When, if, if I Photoshop Zelensky's face onto a picture of someone surrendering, you wouldn't sue Adobe. Photoshop wasn't the reason that was made, it was, it was me. But what happens if I use an AI system to create a deep fake of Zelensky surrendering and you find out that I am a Brazilian national who's currently living in Austria and I used an American system to post it on a trans, you know, like who, who even can bring me to justice? Who, mm -hmm. what, what it's, it's just, just like the problems abound. Like the, the, tech, the, the way we are so connected now and the technologies that connect us are so transnational that our current systems are not up to the challenge of giving us a tool to address these issues. Um, so I think what we need to do is create the both technical solutions and this kind of these de disinformation things. If we can't keep you from doing it, we need to work on keeping people from believing it. Uh, wise words to end on. Um, <laughs> look, Kelly, Roberta, Maggie, thank you very much for joining us today. And to our audience, thank you as well. I'm pleased now to introduce our next event, uh, lunch. So take care. <laughs>